Hi everyone. I just want to let you know we're now officially streaming to Facebook. So, um, but we'll we'll start when or around four o five. So feel free to keep your cameras off and stay on mute. Thank you. All right, we'll start in about a minute or so.
Okay, well, it just turned 406 on my clock here. So um, let's get started. I presume people are going to continue joining us. Um, but good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the February 2022 CAG meeting. Um, thank you for making the time to be here. Um, I think without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Desiree. Thanks, Paula and Tara. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, perfect. Yep. Great, thanks. Uh, let me share my screen. Hold on a second. Okay. Uh, participants can now see my screen. All right, perfect. Um, so welcome everyone, as um, Paula said, to the February 24th, 2022 Community Advisory Group meeting, um, meeting number 18. Uh, we, uh, again, we're trying a new, a new kind of format here. So um, I think everyone was encouraged to um, to attend or view at least the CB3 um, parks meeting where we gave a full presentation on construction updates. Um, and then, so for this meeting, we wouldn't give as much of a redundancy of construction updates and just kind of give again the updates from that meeting. Um, so again, today we're gonna try uh, to have a bit of a shorter presentation. Um, and see how how that goes, and we can you know talk about that at the end of the at the end of this meeting and presentation. Um, so again, I'm Desiree Gazzo from H and T B Lero, um, the project program management construction management team uh, for the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. Um, I'm joined today by my colleagues on the PMCM team, um, DDC, and I'm not sure if if our partner any of our partner agencies are on, but. Um, joined by other colleagues of ours for the project um, to you know, discuss the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. Um, so let's see, moving forward um, with the highlights. So we wanna do a quick recap on the hiring virtual resources event that we had um, last week. Uh, then we'll get into the overview of contracts, which will be again, just an update from what was presented at the CB3 meeting. Um, and if you haven't seen the CB3 meeting, it is on our website um, under uh, project updates, presentations, um, and you can find the CB3 meeting there. Um, and then we have, again, air quality updates for project area two and for project area one. So this will be the first air quality um, update for project area one for the month of January. Um, and then uh, we have some other, a couple of other slides at the end here and then the what we've heard um, like we typically do. Um, so we did receive some questions um, after the CB3 meeting through Pratt, Paula and Tara did send us over um, several questions that were asked by CAG members. Um, so we did try to incorporate most of them here. Um, some of them we will follow up with um, you know, via email, um, we weren't able to address them all for this presentation. Um, but again, we, we are trying to address most of them and anything that's not addressed, we will follow up with um, after this event. So um, February 16th, we had our hiring and virtual resources event. Um, it went really well. Um, Council member Rivera, Carlina Rivera had, um, had an opportunity to speak briefly in the beginning to, to welcome uh, the group. We had Wayne Lambert and team from the New York City DDC Office of Diversity and Industry Relations, uh, both general contracting teams, both Perfetto Contracting Corporation, PCC from Project Area 2, as well as IPC Resiliency Partners from Project Area 1. Um, they and their um, 
hiring compliance uh, teams were present and gave uh, presentations and answered questions. Um, the New York City Department of Small Business Services and Workforce One was present, as well as um, several folks from the Lower East Side Employment Network, also known as Lesson. Um, there were about 30 attendees, um, which is the, the most attendees we've had to date. Um, approximately a third of them were still going through kind of like the attendance uh, lists uh, were from local zip codes uh, to the project. Uh, it was a, a mix of people, um, people kind of new in their profession, people who wanted to get into the construction industry and had some questions about getting into unions, et cetera. Um, some MWBEs were also on the call. Um, it was really great. We had a, kind of an hour long general session, which uh, each of the representatives in the list uh, spoke briefly about, um, you know, their role in hiring compliance and training and resources in the city. And then we broke out into smaller breakout sessions. Um, and so folks could choose um, between the three sessions here and they were, we had them scheduled. Um, so you could participate in all three if you wanted to, because they were every half an hour, we did kind of a switch. Um, and then folks were able to talk one-on-one -on -one with the representatives that participated in the, in the event. Uh, and it was just, it was a, a very informative um, uh, event. And again, we were hoping to do this in person. That didn't work because of the, you know, COVID variants that came out earlier this year. Um, but in the spring, we are looking forward to do more of an in-person event, um, potentially with, you know, similar, um, with similar uh, folks attending, because again, it, they really do offer wonderful resources. Um, and so the presentation is available. So all of the slides that we went through are currently available on our Work With Us page. Um, and the presentation uh, was recorded, uh, but because of the breakout rooms, we have to do some kind of stitching of the video and it, it wasn't one continuous you know, video. Um, so we do have to do that. And then that will be also posted on the website. So folks can, um, you know, can, uh, you know, watch, watch the event as well. Um, the, uh, the, there was a litigation uh, for MWBE numbers that was um, lifted. So next CAG, we will have, and we have online now our um, hiring compliance subconsultants buoy studio. Uh, so next month, we will be able to come back with an update on the MWBE and section three numbers. We did present those, I think it was back in September or October, um, one, of, one of those months, we did present and we did you know, say we were going to come back kind of quarterly with updated numbers, and that had to be put on hold again due to the litigations. So now that that is um, lifted, we can come back with, you know, updated numbers. So we'll look um, to next month to have um, Trang and Stephen, um, who did a wonderful job with this presentation, with this event, um, come back and present more on MWBE and Section 3. Um, so we did, however, still want to include in this deck um, the resources, some of which we don't have currently on our website on the Work With Us page that we are going to update, um, but we kind of broke them out into buckets for kind of individuals seeking career opportunities, MWBEs, uh, MWBE and Section 3 business resources, and then training opportunities. So please do, you know, share these. Um, if there's any questions, there's a questions button, a contact us button on the work with us page. Um, and that will, uh, you know, we'll direct those to our uh, hiring compliance uh, folks. So we did just want to share that, that news and, and these resources up front. Um, and we can take questions on this after. We're only going to have two sessions of questions today. So we'll take that um, in just a little bit. Um, so to get into overview of contracts, um, project area one, you know, moving forward, we still have the partial, partial park closure. Project area two, um, again, we in Astor Levy Playground, Stycove Park, um, and, you know, continuing there, we have a slide. I have some new pictures to show today. 
uh, parallel conveyance um, for any of you, those who were not or did not watch the CB3 meeting. Um, the bid was opened on February 10th. Uh, and if you'd like to see the preliminary results, um, there is that website there. I think there were five, five or six um, bids that were received. And then there was a, um, um, a, a lowest bidder. However, the procurement process is still ongoing. So it, it has not been um, completely finalized. So quickly for project area two, everything is um, moving forward. Um, the handball temporary closure is still in progress. Um, the construction schedule has not changed um, at this point. It is consistent with what we have been presenting um, and the areas under construction, again, are still the same. Uh, Astor Levy Playground will be the first portion of the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project to open, and that will open um, in spring of this year. Um, here are some photos. Uh, the photo to the left, this is the Hamble Court reconstruction that's happening. Um, I think they're um, painting and uh, putting in some new posts and chain link fence. Um, again, you can see kind of, and in the picture I showed last month, it had more of the pathways and et cetera. So these will all be planted areas and there's kind of new pathways in there. Um, so they're working on, on doing that. Um, this is another photo of the Stuyvesant Cove Park flood wall looking north. Um, and then today, um, the first swing gate was, uh, was delivered and installed on site. Uh, so it was a very, um, it wasn't a big event, but it was, it's very exciting that the first gate has come. So that's the vehicular swing gate, which is, uh, I included the map down here. Um, so it's the swing gate that's near the solar one building here. Um, so this portion of the flood wall is uh, completed. And this is a few photos. Um, unfortunately, it was kind of a gloomy day, but <laughs> still, um, these are, this is a few photos of the flood um, gate, the swing gate uh, being delivered and then installed here. And that will swing back, you know, its resting place will be back um, against the wall. And then um, in a occurrence where the floodgates need to be closed, then it would swing um, into place here. So again, this is them um, installing it. I would imagine it's the final grade will be flush with the bottom of the flood wall um, so that there is not a gap. Um, but again, this is the, the installation process. So um, very exciting uh, for Project Area 2. Um, and that all happened this morning. I think several um, media crews were there, so there should be more on that um, in the news. Um, so for environmental monitoring, We've um, made progress with the reformatting of the monitoring reports. Um, again, last year we did receive um, a lot of comments on the format, so we have tried to shorten it. We moved some items to the appendix. Um, we do ask that you take a look at it and we could certainly um, do a deeper dive if necessary on the new format of the um, air quality monitoring report, but we did again try to incorporate the comments that were received. Um, there were uh, one or two comments that had to do, Val, specifically with the 24-hour um, TWA and showing that on the, on, the, um, on the charts. And we couldn't go backwards with that. But I think that is something that we're looking to incorporate moving forwards. So Again, take a look at the new, the updated monitoring reports. We'd be happy to answer any questions um, that you have. Um, and then we also have included the air monitoring summaries. So, you know, monthly we report here at the CAD um, the air monitoring updates in just a quick summary. Um, while again, in the in between releasing the quarterly reports. Uh, so to make it easier for everyone to read those, we've combined them into one um, kind of PDF. So there will be one for 2021, and then there'll be one for 2022, and I guess you know one for PA1 and one for PA2. Um, so those are those are available as well. And then after tonight, we'll add the December update, um, and then we'll start the January PDF as well. Um, we also 
released the um, fat, what we're calling the air monitoring fact sheet. Um, so these are just some screenshots of it. I Paula, I don't know if you shared it with the CAG or not. Um, I didn't yet. Okay. So then, okay, so then this is hot off the press then. <laughs> so um, these are, so again, we took the feedback of, um, of the CAG uh, to reduce some of the text. Again, it is a lot. It's a lot to digest and to squeeze onto two pages to make it, um, you know, kind of easy to read was definitely a challenge. But, you know, I think we did try and do, um, you know, the best we can. And again, taking in the feedback um, was was greatly appreciated. Um, so that is on the environmental monitoring page here. Um, and then these are two of the screenshots um, so from that. Um, you know, it's it's meant to be general and generic and really speak to the process of the air quality monitoring, um, you know, for this project uh, and, you know, in general for air quality monitoring. Um, but so please take a look at that. Um, it is in English only right now. Uh, we will work to uh, for translations, um, but you know, please stay tuned for that. We did want to get it out in the uh, in the English version as well. So for the December update, um, again, the 24-hour TWA did not surpass um, the permissible exposure level for the month of December. Um, on uh, in December on the 10th on the several dates here, the 10th, 25th, 29th, 30th, and 31st, um, the higher readings were recorded. Um, and again, um, it was either um, when no construction activity was, according, was occurring uh, or after hours or on the weekends. And then, you know, the 25th was uh, Christmas, and then you had your New Year's holidays on the 31st, so that was not um, during during work hours. Uh, that was on observed holidays when construction work was halted. Um, and then uh, on the December 10th, it was when um, a number of deliveries were lining up to enter the site. So again, it was, um, you know, small, small uh, uh, surpasses did not surpass the 24 hour TWA. Um, and that was for the month of December. Uh, for the month of January, uh, there were again, several occasions um, where the PEL uh, was surpassed. The 24 hour was not surpassed for the month of January. Um, and uh, several occurred at the end of the work shift and were not attributed to construction activities. Again, once the um, alert is received, um, the, the contractor does assess the situation. Um, and then that is when it can be determined you know, what, what the cause was or may have been. Um, it has been typical for, um, for the levels to rise when there are um, either unloading of materials. Um, again, they're usually very short um, for a 10 or 15 minute duration um, while that event is happening. Um, and then again, it, it goes back to normal afterwards. Um, so that's our first kind of update. And then we'll go into project area one um, in the second update. So we would open it up to questions. Um, on any of the, the material that we presented so far. All right, so far I don't see any. Oh, oh sorry, oh, oh, too soon. Sorry. <laughs> um, Dina, then Wendy. Okay. Hi, Desiree, thanks for the update. Um, this is the first that I've heard about a swinging gate that's near our leased area on the blacktop. So I guess my first question is, which way does it swing? Does it swing to the east or to the west? Sure, it swings, sorry, let me just, oh, oops, wait, sorry, I passed it. Oh, oh, oh I keep going past it, my apologies. Okay, here, so this is, the swing is to the, you know, I guess it swings kind of north, um, 
So you're inside our is it so it's inside our leased area. Um, I'm not, you know, 100. I'm not 100 percent clear on where, you know, the, the lines are, I think. Uh, well, but I can I mean, either it's I mean, directly outside to the north of our leased area is the access road from the gas station. I'm assuming it's not it can't swing there. So there isn't anywhere else that it could swing to as far as I know. Unless it's starting farther north than it seems. I'm just a little unclear about where it actually is. Sure. So, um, you know, I think this might be a conversation that happens between DDC and, and EDC on as far as the leasehold, et cetera. I, to my knowledge, this has been coordinated um, before the installation of the gate. Um, however, I. Mm. Yeah, for Ophelia, if you're on and want to speak to that also. I don't know if anybody else is on, but um, you know, I think that's questions about the leasehold is probably something that would be a DDC, EDC um, discussion. Um, so, Steve, did you want to ask a oh, sorry. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I so hi everybody. I'm I'm Steve. I'm the new CEO at Solar One. Um, so I work with Dina, um, and yeah, I mean that clearly is is swing. You know that the 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 pivot point is on the south end of that gate, and it swings out to the east, right? That seems like what that and so yes, right out right. to the east, and then out to the east. North. Right. And then so right. So it kind of it, it does swing, you know, I'll have to look at the um, I mean, I'll, I could like screenshot the, the map here and then and then overlay it on like our lease map. But um, it seems like that kind of goes out into basically into the space that we that we lease. Um, I mean, it kind of hovers over it, it looks like because it doesn't. Um, but I don't and then does it when it's open? is it flush against the wall or what's the okay so when it's open it's flush against the wall um okay um so it might not be that you know it might be that we are that it it, it kind of goes over our lease property like the width of of the gate itself which is probably like i don't know 18 inches or something like that or two feet or something like that um so we can go back and confirm um <clears throat> We'll, we'll have to double check exactly if it does infringe on the property. And also, um, I'll be reaching out. Hi, this is Ophelia Rivas from DDC IGA. So that. I'll be reaching out. Hey, how are you? Okay. Former council member. Former council member. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll be reaching out to you. Um, if you want, we can take a tour of PA2 and mm, answer your yeah. questions in real time. Um, yeah, that'd so, be great. Yeah, I'll be, rush I'll be re reaching out to you after this call. Okay. So we can set yeah. that up. Okay. Well, one thing I, d I I would like to flag just because I I'm I'm new and just going out with Dina and Candace who manages a stack Cove for us um, a couple weeks ago. Um, we have like serious sinkhole issues on our on 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 in Stack Cove Park. So not in our least area necessarily, although I think maybe a little bit of our least area, but um, certainly in our like our area where we're where we're licensed to do um the management of the park and i'm i'm concerned about the bulkhead and um because our the sinkholes seem to be tied to areas where there's bulkhead deterioration um and i just it's been unclear to me i brought this up with edc whether anyone has done like an analysis of the integrity of the bulkhead along sty cove to to see if like <laughs> the east river is eating away at underneath the park, which I think is what's happening. Yeah, we have had discussions um, with EDC about the bulk hide. Um, So we can also loop them into this conversation because that, okay. that would fall under them. Yeah, we can loop them in. Yeah, they I seem to be like totally like unfamiliar with, with like, Whose responsibility is like we're actually like trying to track down like who's responsible for the sinkholes and i just i mean obviously ddc is going to be rebuilding this park and like you don't want to rebuild it on sinkholes because <laughs> it's not yeah. gonna work 
Yeah, abs absolutely. Um, we can we can follow up uh, and talk to EDC on that. Let's see what's what's actually going on. Cool. Let's yeah. Let's let's definitely do a, a site visit. Like I'm available next week or week after. Let's I'm happy to do it. Great. All right. Sounds good. Cool. I'll I'll, you. Call, I'll call your office to coordinate for sometime soon, either next week or the after. Thank you. Okay. No. Uh, I'll, well, we don't really have a working phone because we're <laughs> kind of getting into our new office. But uh, I'll okay. send you an email. What's What's a good email for you? Uh, oh, okay. It's um R I. Uh huh. V A S. O P. At ddc. Dot n y c. Dot g o v. Got. It. Got. It. Okay. I'll send you an email right now. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Wendy. Um, I'm wondering if um, CAG members can go on that tour. That would be one question. I'm interested also in seeing PA2 and PA1 with you. So we could set up um, a separate CAG uh, tour. So we've had a tour for, you know, the community boards and other, other groups. So we could set up a separate like CAG tour if CAG members are interested in touring PA2. That's not a problem. Thank you. We've been and going also, out with other, yeah, we've been going out with other groups um, to visit the, the, the project site. So that's, that's totally fine. We could work on that. Thank you. My other question mm -hmm. is about the air quality, um, uh, single double page, you, you know, single page thing that we had to look at in advance. Mm -hmm. I see you have another version of it up. I think it was slide. Yeah, you're going there right now. The, um, <clears throat> but I just wonder, did you include any health information, as I asked, in that air quality monitoring fact sheet? Uh, we, this isn't, it's, this fact sheet is for the, how air quality monitoring is being completed and, you know, for the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. There is only a limited amount of uh, space on you know the two pages to incorporate everything so we did do our best to incorporate many of the comments that were received um from from CAG members um and you know the, the I, I, the I wonder are you going to do another are you going to do one about a health imp impacts and some of the things that were left out that are concerns of the CAG or is sure. this so so the with the air monitoring and the levels of uh, oversight that we have in place, there is not meant to be health impacts from the ESCR project. That is why there has been so much, um, again, the environmental process to, to review um, the potential effects, et cetera. That is why we have the levels of oversight, the mitigation techniques, the we're monitoring, you know, the levels have been really you know, great. Um, there were some exceedances again early on, which we're all aware of when the uh, monitor was at the bus stop. And then in July, when we had the, um, the, the, the wildfires out West, but due to construction, the numbers have been um, very low and they've been maintaining, um, you know, great air monitoring uh, from the construction standpoint. Um, and so that is, that is the, that is the result, that is the outcome that we want is that there's not going to be health impacts from, from the ESCR project. You know, it is not for us to speak on general health impacts from you know, construction activities or that are a result of particulate matter or from the, you know, that is, we are speaking on behalf of the ESCR construction project and what we are doing to mitigate impacts you know, for air quality for the project. So, um, you know, I, Wendy, I could certainly bring that back. And we did review, again, all of the comments you, re, you had and incorporated some of them, um, but it's not for us to really report on what are health impacts due to emissions and, and construction related activities. Um, we are trying to put forth the process that Esker, you know, the information here, you know, what are our levels of oversight? What are the roles? When are the alerts? You know, th that is what we're trying to, to portray here. So I understand. Is there any city agency that's watching or no? The, any city yeah. agency tracking like Department of Health? Do they have monitors up? Are they getting this information as well? Your reports? Um, I, 
there haven't been exceedances that would trigger any type of um, you know, reason for the Department of Health to be engaged. Um, I'll, you know, again, I could bring that back, but we have environmental oversight from DEC, DDC, and DEP, and those are the regulatory agencies for construction um, projects for, again, for monitoring, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we can move on to the next portion unless anyone else has any questions. Okay. All right, great, thanks. Um, okay, sorry. Okay, so for project area one, um, for upcoming construction activities, and again, we presented this um, at the CB3 meeting, um, but we do have a few updates. Um, so again, shallow clearing and grubbing activities um, are continuing in the closed portion of the park. Um, excuse me, there is a Con Ed utility work near the ferry landing. We did receive several inquiries about that. Um, it was originally test pits and now it looks like they are doing um, some work in that area there. And we are um, working with, again, Con Ed and the construction team to get uh, more information on the potential work that will happen there. So, you know, please stay tuned. We'll come back with more information on that. Um, the Corlears Hook Park partial closure um, is will not be starting next week. Um, it will likely be starting the week of March 7th. Um, so that has been just pushed a week. Um, so we have been coordinating with um, Friends of Corlears Hook Park. I'll, I'll go over that on the next slide um, about some of the salvaging of materials. And um, we've been working with them in the Parks Department. Um, so we are on the same page uh, with that, um, but the construction activities uh, will not be starting until the week of March 7th, and that will be in the new bulletin that will go out tomorrow. Um, and the advisories will be updated on site as well. Um, the Delancey Street sidewalk closure continues, um, and we are working with DOT on um, improvements to kind of the pedestrian access where that sidewalk closure is. So again, um, please stay tuned for that. Um, the Con Ed work in the shared use path around East Housen Street is again continuing. That'll be there for several months until we shift to the next phase. Um, and then the work, the Con Ed work that was scheduled to start at East 10th Street um, is on hold with uh, the date to be determined. So that are, those are some updates from uh, the last CB3 um, meeting. So again, this is a updated slide for Corlears Hook Park, um, which shows the partial closure here. Um, so when the full section is closed, it will include the flagpole area because the flagpole area is being reconstructed. It's going to be more kind of like an oval instead of a circle, which we've showed um, in the renderings in the previous presentations. Um, so the partial closure until the temporary bridge is up, we have to provide the access to the ferry landing um, through Corlears Hook Bridge. So the flagpole area will remain open um, and then the access way will be open here. Um, and uh, that again, work is scheduled to start uh, the week of March 7th. Um, again, if you wanna see the presentations that were presented in, um, January of 2020, that has a lot more information on the work that is happening there. Um, and then we presented at the last CAD meeting with a little bit more information as well um, as some of the renderings. Um, Desiree, can I ask a question? This is Don Hartley from uh, Friends of College Hook. Oh, hi, Don. My, hi. Mike um, had asked me to uh, see if the walkway path that will be running along the uh, gateway, uh, the gatehouse by the ball field, is mm -hmm. that going to be allowed to maintain open until they do the work for the gatehouse? Oh, here, this area yes. here? Yes. Oh, okay, I understand. So, so this whole portion of the park is going to be closed here? Um, so there won't be anywhere to go when 
if people come here, there's there isn't anywhere to get to. So regardless, you'd have to go around to Jackson and then to Cherry to get back on to the sidewalk here. Um, so the, the full closure is still under review and is kind of being finalized what the detour is and what the signage is going to be like. Um, but we also are considering the fact that since there isn't anywhere to go, it would cause kind of a dead end um, area between the FDR and the um, and the fence here. So I'm, you know, again, it, nothing is finalized, but there's a good chance that this whole area would be closed again, just because there isn't, there wouldn't be a connection under here as they'd be working on um, the bridge and then in this whole area. The only consideration that we'd ask is that if that gatehouse would not work, would not start any time in the near future, uh, if that walkway can be maintained open for a portion of it towards the Action Avenue. Not, obviously not the entire walk, right? That's all. I know there's going to be an access going over to the ferry at some point over there. Um, so Michael just wanted to know if that would be able to be maintained open at any point until that gatehouse at work starts. Sure. Yeah, and it the the so the temporary so while the um, when Corlier's Hook Bridge is open for access, it'll happen through you know the the central portion of the park and through the flagpole area. Right. And then right. again, as preliminarily designed, um, it's still under you know the, the final reviews um, that the pro proposed pedestrian bridge that would also not be accessed through that lower pathway. It would be accessed from the upper level of the park um, to kind of so that way you don't have as big of a, a ramp there. So it would be. Um, you know, access through the upper level of the park and then for passive lawn area. So there, you know, again, we I could totally take that back. Um, uh, but there, and the conversations are ongoing, but there isn't, again, we just don't want to create an unsafe condition there where someone would be like trapped and not have anywhere to go. Um, so we want to make sure that that's closed, you know. Yeah, thank you. Uh -huh. um, and then speaking to also some of the questions that we had about um, if Jackson Street would be a viable um, location for the pedestrian, the temporary pedestrian bridge. Um, and that would make the bridge fall into what is under construction for Pier 42. So we cannot right. cross um, the Pier 42 construction area. The Esker limits end here at the, you know, just. Um, at the ferry terminal and at this passive lawn area here. Um, so that would, you know, that isn't feasible. The team did look at several different alternatives. Um, right. you know, this one, and uh, this is, again, still under review, not finalized, but we did want to, you know, present uh, mm -hmm. the, the preliminary locations, but that Jackson, several folks did ask um, about the Jackson Street, both at the CB3 meeting and through the questions, et cetera. So we did just want to speak to that. Um, right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So moving on to uh, the air quality monitoring. Nope. Oh, nope. Hi. Yeah. Just since we are on Corlears, uh, how long would the, this is Tony Rivera from OLS Little League. Uh, we're, we're a permit holder in the, in the Corlears hook uh, ball fields. How long will the construction run and will the ball fields always be available throughout the construction period? The ball fields will not be impacted. It will only be the Cherry Hill um, and then this area to the left or to the south, I guess, of the Corlier Hook Bridge. So the remainder of the park will be, um, will be open. And I believe we don't have the final date of when the work will be completed here. But in the um, construction approach, which is online, um, I believe this area will open before next summer. I have to just, let's just see. Quick. Um, yes, it is scheduled to be open before summer 2023. Um, again, as soon as we have a better, uh, that question has been asked and um, we are working on uh, a response, a better response than summer of 2023. But, Per the construction approach, um, the southern portion of the park, so this area here, which includes Corlier's Hook Bridge and Corlier's Hook Park, 
um, is scheduled to be open for summer 2023. So by next um, summer. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Do we want to take other Corlears hook? We can, we can do that if, if you want. We could take more Corlears hook part questions while we're here. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. With that section uh, that's closed off between Jackson Street and the temporary bridge along the FDR, mm -hmm. and it started off as one or two plantings by several people in the neighborhood, and it has grown to at least a dozen, maybe more. I don't know if Parks is on the online, but uh, this issue was raised years ago about the dangers of eating uh, vegetation that was placed there. Um, has Parks reached out to these people and given them educational information? I know this was also an issue about some of the fish that folks were eating from the East, East River to start a campaign to educate people. Um, and I understand parks have some rules and requirements about planting on parks, which this, this area seems to uh, well, just be ignored, but have more and more about the education component of this. And I don't know if parks is online to speak about that because I know that that area has grown in the last few years uh, where there's at least a dozen people there now. Yeah, thanks, Trevor. Um, I don't know about park. I don't, I don't believe parks is online, so we could definitely take that back to them. Um, we don't, I don't know if they have reached out with any educational material like you have mentioned. Um, our CCL Joyce um, did reach out and leave several signs there um, to reach out to her because as we understand from coordination with Friends of Corlear Sook Park um, and several others that uh, the community that manages the those gardens down there um, speak Mandarin as and Joyce speaks Mandarin as well. So we were hoping to get them um, to speak to each other so that we could inform them that the construction would be happening there and the gardens, you know, are going to have to be um, relocated or potted or I you know however they want to move forward with that. But they have not um, reached out to us. We are still trying to communicate there. So if anyone in the neighborhood, you know, does see folks out there, I mean, we have, again, laminated signs all along the gardens, um, but we haven't been able to get in contact with um, them. But in regards to the educational signage, um, we can bring that question back to parks or the educational material about gardening. Yeah, yeah. Right, it might be a little late. And I mean, since this is technically parks uh, and not a community garden, I, I don't know park position. So I'll, I'll wait for parks to, to comment on that. But thank you. Yep. Wendy, do you have a Corlears Hook Park question? Yeah, just where is the temporary bridge? Is there a location for it yet? So the location is still preliminary. So it would be. Um, stemming out of Corlears Hook Park in, again, part of the closed area. Um, it would travel along that kind of sidewalk area um, between the Corlears Hook Bridge and, and Jackson. Um, and then it would cross over the FDR into the south portion of the passive lawn area. And, and why can't it go, oh, excuse me, why can't it go just a little bit further south? into the parking lot area that's sitting empty right there instead of coming into this mushy field of green. I'd really, as you know, like to preserve the trees that are there. There's, if folks don't know, there's 33 trees. That's the last of the trees that are mature, that are native plants. Um, is there any way that bridge could be angled? So if they land in the parking lot and not require more tree removals. Sure, so this area that is north or south rather of the passive lawn area is EDC for Pier 42. So that area is under construction. That is going to be the Pier 42 upland area that connects to the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project limits. Um, so this, this is an, you know, under construction and the you know, the temporary bridge needs to fall um, within the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Limits and again, cannot impede upon that construction area. Even though it's been empty for the whole time, you know, I, I, until recently, I could look and see that area. Now, didn't have anything there but a little pile of rubble. 
And, um, you know, it just seems like when there was a fence there and the compost yard there, there was a corridor in between with those mature trees. And people used to duck across when you first put that gate up by the ferry. So it's kind of a no man's land between it. I see that the ferry is shown on the DDC side of things. So why didn't you move the ferry? Um, you know, all of this doesn't make sense to me for the number of few riders that use that ferry in the past. I don't know if ridership has changed, but you to be so um, focused on these divisions and not on preserving any sense of a park or trees in this place. I don't know. I just wish that preserving nature had been part of the goal of this plan. And it really hasn't been. It's really been the opposite. So I'll stop there, but I'm very disappointed in this. Um, I also, again, not knowing that we were gonna have questions in the middle of the presentation on the what we've heard slide, um, I do speak to the passive lawn area um, and the fact that in order to meet the flood protection um, grade elevation of the park, that area, the whole passive lawn area will be raised um, several feet. So the trees do need to come down. So it isn't a matter of, um, you know, it's again, it's not due to the temporary bridge. It's not due to these temporary um, items. It, it is for the flood protection. And that is the goal of this project is, is the flood protection. I was under the impression that area wasn't being raised or the, uh, and um, so that's it, new information here. Um, how many feet? Uh, I believe about th at least three feet. I have to go back and, and consult with the team, but it's several feet. Okay. All right. I think in the interest of time, let's, let's continue with the presentation. Yeah. So the air quality monitoring locations were presented at the CB3 meeting. Um, so they are here as well. Um, they are strategically placed along the edge of active construction activities. Um, and they will move as the construction moves. Uh, for January, again, um, kind of the end of the year, the beginning of January was when the um, monitors were, uh, did begin installation. So uh, this is when there was clearing and grubbing and removals, um, as well as the Delancey Street Bridge pedestrian removals towards the middle to the end of the month. Um, and again, the PM daily value did not surpass the PEL for the month of January. Um, again, currently all six are installed per the previous map. Um, and then again, for air monitor, for one of the air monitors, a, um, a higher PM 2.5 reading uh, was recorded on the morning of January 5th for two short durations, again, uh, 15 minutes. Um, and again, uh, the construction activities are being closely monitored. Um, and I have a couple more thoughts on that on the what we've heard slide. So we'll talk about it um, then. Uh, just a very quick update. We did start installing the decorative mesh panels um, that like we've had on project area two. So uh, this morning we were out there um, putting up some panels. Uh, the panels will be available on the website as well for people to view if they have, you know, if they can't make it out to the site. Um, but they are along the construction fence here, um, what we're calling the Stanton Street um, kind of limits of the construction. Um, and then there will be more placed uh, throughout the site showing renderings of the new park, speaking to the flood protection, the resilient plantings, um, and just the process, what's going on. I think there's, I, we, I think we all know there's a lot of kind of confusion about some of the, um, you know, the improvements to, to the project. Um, I spoke with a couple people on site this morning. Um, and, you know, again, we're hoping these will be educational. And then uh, come the spring, we'll also have the um, call for art um, artists panels up as well. Um, a couple of items. This is the last slide on the what we've heard. Um, we know there was some additional questions uh, on the tennis house. So OMB was not available for this meeting, but um, Pratt We'll be collecting, thank you, Paula and Tara, um, additional questions um, th that, that you may have. Um, there have been several questions about the cars and trucks on the Esplanade. Um, so parks vehicles can 
drive throughout the park. You know, they have to access all, all of the park um, that is open. And, and again, they go in the closed sections as well, but they are permitted to drive anywhere on the park. Um, there is, uh, I think I had mentioned before, there is a Con Ed project that's happening to the very, very north of the project that's separate um, from the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. Those trucks are encouraged, trucks and cars, it's a mixture, are encouraged to um, use the shared use path um, as that other Con Ed work is happening for the oil static lines um, at Houston Street. It is fully locked off, but there are people there to open the gates and close the gates. Um, there will be circumstances where work in there will prevent um, access. Again, that is such a tight spot between um, the FDR and the ball fields in some locations that it is, you know, once they start doing the um, pile driving and the cranes come in, there may be instances or if they have, you know, a, a large opening where the trucks, again, and uh, cars cannot go through that, that it would be dangerous for them. So there are instances where they will have to drive around that work area. Um, again, we're making every effort to keep as much as the park open, but the work needs to get done um, in the, you know, in the sequence to, to make this um, be a five-year project. Um, erosion and sediment control, there is active monitoring of sediment and erosion control on site. Um, there is an, a tracking pad. I know we received a question about, is there a tracking pad? There is a tracking pad. It's right before the very, very end um, of the shared use path, uh, before you hit Montgomery Street. Um, there are other mitigation measures being in place. There were pictures of uh, trucks without full tarps on them. Um, there are trucks driving all around um, the site. There are very specific requirements set in place by um, by the, again, state and local uh, governments on when specifically the trucks need to be tarped and what they're carrying. And it's not as cut and dry as every time a truck is in motion, it needs to, you know, so um, I just wanted, you know, to, to mention this and we can continue to have conversations um, about it, but, you know, right now the ground is primarily frozen. So there isn't a lot of, um, a lot of excess dust again, as shown by the, the air monitors, the contractors are employing the mitigation me measures. Um, so they are monitoring everything that's on, you know, that's happening on site. Um, and again, we'll continue through the life of the project. Um, the tree removals, we received several questions on. Uh, the tree removals were determined during the design phase based on construction impacts in coordination with the Parks Department. The tree removals are not something that the contractor is just making up. You know, it's it's in the EIS and it's in the mass mailing, the contract drawings. Um, the, you know, the contractor at this point is following the, the contract of work for the flood protection. Um, any tree removals um, on any project, not just this project, um, needs to be permitted by a parks par, uh, forestry permit. Um, they're not posted on site. It's not like the Department of Buildings where they have to post um, permits on site. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about what must be submitted to parks as part of the tree work permit, uh, oops, parks has uh, provided the, um, the website there. Um, so, you know, we will not be posting those permits um, that on, on site. It's not something that, that happens uh, for projects in the city. Um, and I think I mentioned, I think I covered the passive lawn. Um, many of the fields are having ponding issues, et cetera. So those will all be assessed when the weather warms up um, by the Parks Department moving forward. So I can't believe we're at five o'clock and this is a shorter presentation than we usually give, but I'm happy to take uh, questions. I'm, hi, this is Charles Grizel. I'm uh, curious about the access to the ball fields there at uh, at Houston Street. It's very difficult to get to the ball fields from Houston Street. There's only one entr entrance from the uh, south ramp, the ramp that runs south from Houston Street into the park. And coming from 6th Street, you have to go all the way around to the Esplanade to get into the ball fields. Those are the only two places I've seen that are open. So is there gonna be an, a better way to access the ball fields when uh, spring comes? 
Yeah, so we can bring that back to Parks Department. Um, again, the Parks Department is in charge of open um, amenities. Um, again, the, if it's you know, if there are closures due to construction, we will work with Parks Department on, you know, any if there needs to be new access, etc. Um, but we will bring that back to parks, especially for the spring when the ball fields are being heavily used. I know right now um, there's a lot of folks using them. Um, but but not for for ball games. Um, so we will bring that back to them and work on the, the access there. And the, the the con ed work that's being done right there, in front of the ball fields on that on that road. How long is that going to be going on? Is that are they redoing the uh, cabling or what is what's going on there? Yeah. So we did have um, in the CB three. Uh, presentation and in the previous CAG presentation, there is a little sketch of what's happening there. So they're um, working on the oil static lines, which provide the power to um, lower Manhattan. Um, and due to the uh, the fill that's going to go on top of it, they also have to um, put in kind of sheet piling system and uh, provide a support for the oil static line so that the pressure doesn't, you know, create uh, pressure on those lines. Um, so there is a significant amount of work happening and that will happen in three phases heading north. Um, so this, the part that's closed now will be closed for um, several months. And then once that part is finished, then they'll move to the next section around the East 6th Street um, bridge and then they'll move forward north um, north of that. So it will be a quite you know, a process. So do you anticipate that work interfering with uh, the recreational uh, recreational games that might be going on in the parks right there at this ball so field it's as long as the if the if the work is meant to not um impact those open spaces uh there will be large cranes and there will be sheet piles so i would imagine if there is any point in time where a field or a portion of the park would need to be temporarily closed again, you know, to move materials in, um, et cetera, um, then that would be communicated and coordinated in advance with parks and the fields. However, it is the intention, you know, to limit that work to just the closed portion of the shared use path. Yeah, I mean, I, when you do talk to parks, I would think that it might be better if they cut a new um, gate into the parks right there in the fence along the north edge uh, that runs across from 6th uh, yeah. Street, the 6th Street uh, access, because yeah. otherwise you're walking right in the middle of the field in the middle mm -hmm. of a game to, I mean, there's no way to get in and out, you know? So I think it's really gonna be important to figure that out before springtime. Okay, we can certainly bring that back to parks, thank you. Thanks. Bell? Yes, um, my question is, I think I've asked this before, the Corlears Hook Bridge, um, the temp, I think it's the temporary bridge, whatever, um, it doesn't interfere with um, the park that's here, because there's a park where in the summertime, um, I would say young children tend to have parties where the slide and whatnot is, and then where I'm assuming what I'm looking at is a um, soccer uh, goal thing that goes to Jackson. Um, you know, I just want to know, does it interfere with that? Because I have to say uh, the other week when the snow was out, kids were, uh, I'm assuming those were orange sleds that they all had um, over, I'm going to say towards the south, right next to where the present bridge is. So does the pres does the plan uh, not interfere with the parks that are here. The the park where the children play and then the park where I'm assuming that's uh, soccer. Yeah, so Val, thanks. The No, it will not interfere with any of the fields um, and open areas kind of along Jackson Street and along um, the west portion of Cherry Street. Um, the hill that, from what we've heard, that um, the kids were sledding down. It's just known as Cherry Hill. That portion will be under construction as well as the flagpole area. And then the hill that is on the other side of the Corlears Bridge. Okay. And one other thing I, I just want to say, because somebody said, you know, 
think about Jackson Street. One of the things about Jackson is that's cars going on to the FDR drive going south is they come down Jackson Street and get on the drive. So I, I don't know that I think that's the safest place for you know people to plan a, a lot of walking where cars are getting onto the FDR drive south. Yeah, again, that was looked at uh, as, an, as an option and it was determined that it was, was not feasible there, so. Oh, okay, all right, good, thank you. All right, Thanks, Frank, Al. Frank then Robin. Thank you. Hey, Desiree. Uh, how are you doing? Um, just to piggyback on Val's comment, uh, I, I just had a question because when I had heard people mention about a putting a bridge on Jackson, um, which is, uh, you know, for those of us who live right next to it, we understand that it ends at grade with the FDR. And there's also that ball field that Tony was mentioning too. Um, there's an entrance there, there's a sidewalk there. And it didn't really make sense, but I'm not an engineer. Um, a lot of the questions about moving the bridge there but my question is, and I get it that it's not feasible, but is it only not feasible because of Pier 42? Uh, because it just seems like on the Jackson side, there are so many um, legitimate barriers to why you wouldn't have the bridge there. And I'm wondering if that's something that you can share, or is it really just because it's, uh, it would be kind of going right into the Pier 42 area? I'm sure there's probably a lot of reasons. I mean, one of the um, benefits, oh, sorry, I keep flicking this uh, thing. One of the benefits of it starting up at Corlears Hook Park is that the grade is much higher up here. Exactly, so yeah. The ramp system that you have to have to cross the FDR bridge with enough clearance, when you start from a lower grade, like where at Jackson Street is, as opposed to a higher grade where at you know, the top of Corlears Hook is um, you have to make up so many more kind of runs of. Uh, of yeah, ramp. that's what I was thinking because the whole thing is one big angle from Cherry down to essentially South Street. And I, I, I just was, again, like it, it didn't really, I couldn't understand the logic because you would be cutting off the whole entrance because you'd have to ramp up. To Whereas, ramp up. like you said, it's, yeah, it's already on uphill. Okay, yeah. thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bobby. Frank. Robin? Yeah, hi. Hi, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, I get it would be great to know Desiree. What hi Desiree. It would be great to know what the what what the reasons are that they found that that bridge wasn't gonna work there. And we're just talking about a temporary bridge. We're not talking about a permit the permanent building of a bridge, but you know, something temporary. So if you could get us, I, I'd love to hear what the reasons are that it wasn't feasible. You said you don't you you don't really know, or is that what you just said now? I'm not sure. No, I mean, it looked like she, it, the, the, the main reason being the, the Pier 42, but there, there are, it seems like there are also possible other reasons as well. So, I mean, I'm sorry, all, I mean, I know, I feel like we've kind of driven this one to the ground um, and, and we really thought that we would have more time on the CAG portion. So I'm just gonna ask that we can move this along unless you have another question, Robin. Yeah, I just want to mention one thing. I know uh, I was in the car before I couldn't respond, but your reports about the air quality, um, you know, living on Grant Street about four blocks up from the park, uh, there has also been a change in 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 the wind. And, it, and, and that's something else to think, you know, I don't know how we monitor that, but it's since those trees are gone, uh, the wind gales have been much fiercer and stronger. So um, I'm sure that's affecting some of the people in the community, but that's something else to note. And I don't know how one monitors that, but it's very noticeable. Okay, we could, I could certainly bring that back, Robin. Thanks. You're welcome. Wendy? Um, so back to Jackson Street, I noticed on a, a document, it shows there's a cr great deal of sewer work going on along Jackson Street, right where it hits the FDR. Is that still correct? Uh, I believe there's parallel conveyance work that's happening uh, at Jackson and uh, again, in that area, I'd have to check if it's in project area one uh, as well. Right now, the closures would only be you? here for Corlier Hook Park and not Jackson Street at this point in time. Okay, my only other question is, how does mitigation apply to the open 42% of the park? I, I'm sorry, can, can you maybe restate the question? So the 42% of the park is open. Is there any aspect of mitigation that applies to that 42%? Right now, it's kind of a, 
you know, it doesn't give much to the community, but yet it's an open 19 acres of park. So is there any plan to make it a little more accommodating this summer? Any kind of shade area being added or picnic zone? Anything for the community to improve the park that's open? Um, I can certainly bring that back to parks. Um, I don't know if they were planning on doing any improvements for the open area of the park, so I could bring that back to them. You know, even having something as simple as a stewardship shed for the people who are going to be ta helping take care of the park would be very nice. You know, people do not have anywhere else to go, as you know. Yes, I understand. And that's part of the reason why there was the phased, um, phased, you know, closure of the park. So that way, that portion would remain open. Well, my point is that Many times you've shown us other parks in the area that are open, that have new paint or new AstroTurf, but there's never been a mention of the open 42% of the park. And we've just heard how, many, how difficult it is to even get to a field. Okay. So think of the park that's open under the umbrella of mitigation. That's all I have to say. Great, I, you know, I think, I would imagine, again, I'm not parks, but I would imagine that they don't want to put too much into the park that is going to be, um, you know, under construction again in a year as the construction moves north. So, um, but I could bring back, you know, temporary things, you know, perhaps that would be. Yeah, a year is a really long time in the life of a child. One summer is forever. So thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much, Desiree and the rest of the city agencies um, for attending. Um, again, you're at this point free to move um, on to hopefully the end of your day. Um, and the CAG members, we will take a brief two minute bio break, um, please. And we'll, we'll start back up at 5.15. Um, so three minutes, excuse me. Um, so we can continue on with the portion of our meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, you guys take a break when I finally am able to log in. <laughs> Bye, Michael. <laughs> Just a brief one. You, you won't miss, you, you, you're right on time for the CAG member portions.
Can I presume that a lot of you are back and just have your cameras off? Hello, Robin. I see some signs of life, even in the form of icons of thumbs up. Um, yeah, it's five sixteen. Let's let's get back into it. Um, Tara, do you, you want to do the roll call? Yeah, just very briefly. Um, again, if I if I don't call your name, that means I might have missed you. But I was just taking roll call off of the participant screen. Um, so we have Richard Heitler, Dina, Wendy Brar, Robin, Val. Oh, I think I had Robin. I'm sorry, I had you written down twice. Seth Corin, Susan Steinberg, Trevor Holland, Charles Krizel, Tony Rivera, Diane Lake, Frank, um, Dan Hart, Don Hartley. Excuse me, from um, Friends of Corlears, and then now we have Michael here. Um, have I missed anyone else? Dill uh, Goldman from East River. Oh, I'm tagged up. I didn't see your name. Sorry about that. Um, anyone else on the CAG that I missed? That Martin, the Martin Barrett from Sykes uh, and Cove. Hi, Martin. Oh, wow. I missed a couple of you. I'm surprised. Um, anyone Sandra else? Sandra McKee from CB6. All right. Hello, Sandra. Hi. Great. All right. Anyone else? Good night. My name is Chanel Elliott. I'm representing um, State Assemblyman Harvey Epstein's office. Okay. Well, okay. This roll call is just for 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 the actual CAG members. So I'm sorry. Just but but um, any we definitely appreciate all of the elected officials. If you are an elected official rep, please put your name in the chat and who um, which office you're representing. That would be great, just for efficiency's sake. Um, but the roll calls for for the CAG members. So Tara, just I'm I'm here representing uh, Gouverneur Gardens. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I know you're here for in in lieu of Sam. All right. All right, so I think we can go ahead, Paula. Great. Um, so we wanted to, we have, you know, an idea of how to uh, spend our time here, which is a lot, a lot of time until 6 p.m. compared to previous meetings. Um, but basically, Tara and I kind of think that the moment is ripe right now to have a little bit of a, a reset of sorts. That may not be exactly the right word. Um, but the idea is, you know, things are really moving, obviously. Um, there are no more lawsuits, at least for the time being, to slow things down. So, you know, this project is obviously really moving forward. Um, and in spite of that, um, there's still a lot of unanswered questions that you guys have posed over the weeks and the months. So we thought it would be important to sort of revisit those, like, main categories of of questions and unaddressed items um, and go through them and, you know, really kind of try to prioritize them by um, what is the most urgent, like in a, in a like time-wise speaking, but also prioritize these outstanding items by, um, by basically your ability to, to influence them. <laughs> um, so, Tara and I prepared a list. It's just a list. Um, we might be missing some stuff. We might be overemphasizing other topics that you know aren't maybe that important. Um, but we thought we would throw it out there just to throw this list out there um, during this conversation, just to facilitate the conversation. Um, and yeah, is there anything I missed, Tara? Um, as far Nothing as kind else. of framing the, the, the purpose of today's conversation? No, um, and I'm a visual person. So I thought, you know, especially since we're gonna talk a lot instead of just us talking at you, having it visually on the screen, of course, this is a document that we will, um, you know, summarize, clean up, add notes to send you all after the fact, just so we can figure out like what our, what we would wanna do next step wise with, with what, we're, what, what we prioritize today, excuse me. Um, yeah, so does that make sense to people before we get started? I just wanted to see if anyone had any questions. I mean, my, my big concern is uh, keeping the park open during the summer for people to be able to access the fields and everything. 
And uh, I think that's going to be a major issue coming forward. I, I, I see that as an ongoing thing for the entire length of the project, whether the northern section of uh, project one is uh, open or the southern section is going to be very difficult to make sure that people have actually have access. You can say that the fields are open, but if you can't get to the fields, they're not, they're, it's not accessible. So I think that's a major issue we should continue to talk about. It yeah, seems all the concerns are for project area one. Pardon me? The, 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 uh, the items that are, are listed are just for project area one? Uh, for the most part, but again, like this, the, uh, yeah. this is not a finite list. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is really for us to just kick off the conversation. So as ah, we move okay. through, we can add to it. Um, but I mean, we are, I know, you know, primarily right now, I, this is, I think a lot of this is based off PA, um, PA1. Um, PA, uh, parallel conveyance is in both. Um, and I'd like to join that small group meeting. Um, and I'd okay. also like yeah, to. Well, I'd okay. like to... We're going to get there. I, I just wanted okay. to see if anyone had questions to the, I mean, questions I about can... just the, the general concept that I presented about the, the, the goal of this conversation. Not to actually get into content per se yet. I think it makes sense, but I don't know that we're seeing all the list. I see phasing on the bottom. Is that the last item? Yeah, we will item? scroll down. We're going to start at the top. We'll scroll down. It's, unfortunately, I can't fit everything on the screen, Wendy. Trust. We'll get on. We'll get to it. Okay. So let's let's start. So yes, yeah, speaking of parallel conveyance, happens to be first on the list. Um, DDC has suggested that for people who are interested in this topic that they can, they're happy to do a small group meeting. Um, I, know, I know that's of interest to Doug. Um, he's indicated that. Wendy, you just indicated interest. Um, so does, uh, does anyone else want to join that meeting? I would like to, Michael Marino from Corlears. Okay. Anybody else? You can let me know later, but not too much later. People are raising their hand. I might be there. Yeah, I'm looking at, on. yeah. I see Trevor Frank, okay. No, I'm not interested in joining <laughs> the group. I'm just uh, glad that we're moving it out to a separate section because I've sat through a lot of those. I don't need to sit through another one, but I'm glad that's being separated out because I think that's useful to have a more in-depth discussion on something that's really a huge project. But I think that's a wise move. That's all. Great. Um, Susan and Frank, am I taking your raised hands as as wanting to participate? In that? Yeah, I lowered it, but yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. And then we'll do another call out um, again after the meeting. Um, but this I'll is just good say if I can quickly on the parallel conveyance. This is one of the few projects that there's actually going to be construction on our side of the FDR. There's going to be a lot of work that's going to be on our streets. You'll have traffic and it'll be affecting people in our neighborhood in a different manner than just the park itself. So to me, that's one of the reasons why I think it's also very important for all of us, or at least, you know, in my mind. Well, again, we'll, we'll send a, an email after this meeting probably tomorrow to see if anyone else is interested so we can get this meeting set up, <clears throat> excuse me, sooner rather than later. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> um, moving on, oh, I don't know what just happened to my voice. <coughs> um, moving on to the next topic, please excuse how crazy I sound. <coughs> um, so the, the, oh my gosh, my voice is like so affected. This is so weird. Give me one moment to try yeah, to if you'd like, Paula, I can take over for now if you'd like. We can go, go and grab some water. Um, uh, so here again, preserving the track house and the tennis center comfort station. We know that we had the CAG letter in support of Lesby um, making that request. Um, we did get a, I, I, I don't know if we can call it a response from OMB, but it wasn't quite. Um, it was actually addressed to Lesby. Um, and it really did ignore the requests that were made. Um, and I know that um, OMB was not able to attend today's meeting and they're happy to have questions sent their way. Um, and we would like to take, a, I guess, a short period of time to try to get um, 
of just a summary of any other outstanding questions that we want to pose to OMB. We know that the it's it's not imminent, but it is coming soon. So we would just want to make sure that we are um, moving ahead with any communications on learning more about what's going to be happening with the track house and the comfort station. Yeah, and just to add to that, the letter <clears throat> from OMB didn't it didn't address your question whatsoever about you know requesting a feasibility study for possibly preserving the um, the comfort station. <clears throat> Excuse me. So given that um, the demolition actually at this point, I believe, is scheduled for some time in March, um, but this this is sort of at the top of the list of this draft list because again, it's a it's a a timely manner. So I want to ask what what <clears throat> if anyone wants to propose a next step on this topic. <laughs> I mean, does it make sense to send a follow-up letter or do we just think we're gonna get the same non-response? Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing is that, you know, I know it concerns me that they just completely ignored the CAG in this and sent us a letter that was actually addressed to someone else. And then when we called them out and said, why did you do that? They said, oh, well, because this is good enough, right? And I, I think that's not respectful of the CAG, um, regardless of the outcome on these buildings. So um, is there a way that we can contact OMB, you know, more quickly or more directly uh, to Michael's point or just a, you know, is there a way that we can write a, a quick response to OMB um, that doesn't take us a long time to approve? Um, just saying, you know, you didn't, answer our questions, please, you know, respond to what the CAG raised. Okay, no, absolutely. I think this is something that we can raise with DDC. And then I know, I believe we do have our OMB contacts as well that we can just raise this with to say like this, yeah, this was instead of writing a, a whole other letter um, that we really needed a more immediate response to the, to the feasibility request that was made. And I'm wondering too, Tara, this is Frank, uh, if um, since they're saying the track house work is not yet scheduled, you know, maybe there leaves open the window of having a more meaningful response uh, for something that isn't going to be perhaps demoed by the time it reaches someone's desk who could properly answer. Absolutely. I think we can we can we can go back and raise this with with DDC right away. Yeah. <clears throat> and Tara, even though the that this may be imminent, um, they said they couldn't attend this meeting, and I understand the timing uh, is to invite them to the next meeting, regardless of what happens. Okay. Yeah, they actually said they had a, a schedule conflict today, and that's why they couldn't be here. Okay. But we'll give them enough time this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Um, I think I'm back. Sorry about that. <clears throat> um, next topic: MWBE and Section Three hiring. Um, this has been, you know, a priority that I've heard from you guys, kind of off and on, not off and on, but here and there. Um, as Desiree reported, because the litigation had been happening, they weren't able to report out on their hiring numbers um, yet, but now that it has been lifted, they'll be able to do that at next month's meeting. So that's sort of the status on that. Um, is there anything else, you know, uh, CAG members that, that you, find you know that is very urgent or timely or you know that, something else about this topic that you want to raise um, do you want to like see how they report out next month and take it from there you know i thought damaris i don't know if she's here today had a great suggestion last month which was that they send the open jobs out directly to the cag and 
um, I saw I'm a member, Green Map is a member of um, the LES Ready, and they sent out a whole list of jobs this week, nothing from Esker. So it would be so nice to see some community people who can actually walk to work, go th work there, not just all these cars from Jersey and Westchester. So uh, I think this is Frank. I, I um, uh, and I apologize because earlier I was only listening audio. I, I couldn't see the presentation. I don't know if Desiree talked because they did have a, a kind of job fair very recently. Um, and yeah. so to Wendy's point, though, I it's not like there aren't a lot of local organizations directly involved in this MWB in hiring. Um, and some of it's, uh, you know, I mean, I attended that meeting. I don't know if anyone else did. But they really did have a lot of different avenues for jobs and offerings. And I think that it would be kind of insulting to decide that the CAG somehow is a more appropriate body as opposed to goals, as opposed to Henry Street Settlement, as opposed to Lesson, et cetera. Um, so I'm not really in favor of directing at um, these jobs uh, through the CAG because I think that there are neighborhood established uh, CBOs, et cetera, who are doing this work um, and have been on the ground doing it. I may have misspoke, Frank. She may have said lesson, to send it to lesson. And they were, of course, part of the event. Yeah, yeah, they're definitely That's they a did a big rundown on everybody who was there during this meeting. Also, did they mention, because in that meeting, um, and again, I'm, what I'm asking is if they mentioned in the beginning of this meeting where I, 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 I was in the air, I couldn't attend, but uh, did they mention that they had reached their goal uh, because that's what was announced at that um, hiring, um, you know, it was a few hour, uh, you know, job fair online, but they had, they had exceeded their percentage uh, already. Because uh, I think the real issue and some of the things that we were talking about uh, when some of us, uh, Damaris, I know I owe myself, uh, for example, we were working on the MWB, uh, gosh, I don't even know how time flies, but last year at some point, uh, you know, my request is that, um, and it, it, it sort of dovetails similarly to what Wendy was saying, but we had, we wanted to focus on the idea that they were having uh, uh, a kind of uh, benchmark to meet within the zip codes of the affected areas, as opposed to seeing mostly what's going to be happening, uh, perhaps, uh, West, you know, for some of the upper level jobs like Westchester and Long Island and Staten Island, which great for them, uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm looking through this uh, with an equity lens. So in other words, I'm advocating, you know, if, if we're if we're going to be talking about that, that would be a kind of point uh, to kind of pressurize them upon just like focusing on, on the neighborhood the zip codes uh, specifically. Okay. Yeah, they actually she did. I don't believe um, Desiree had mentioned that they had reached their goal. Um, yeah. And I think, well, I also I think because they, they the only thing she'd announced is that they will be um, at least starting to report out shortly. Um, they were not able to um, due to the the lawsuit, but this is um, this is good to know. And I'll look up my notes, and you know, maybe yeah. I don't, I don't want to. So maybe we just put that in quotes that needs to be confirmed because uh, yeah. I, I don't want to put out misinformation. Then all right, and then also, I mean, um, Wendy, I, I mean, I don't want to like speak on your behalf, but I, I don't think that the CAG should be the main vehicle for for jobs. But do you is it that you're that the you would want job postings to also go through the CAG for distribution as well. I'm, I'm also, also, yes, oh. that, you know, so people here who care, who we, a lot of us, have, like, you know, as Frank mentioned, several people here have worked really hard on this issue. And it would be nice to get some, you know, actual postings that could be conveyed outwards from here. So I'm sure that they are sending them all over if there's job openings, but to okay. add the CAG to the list. Would be very nice. And okay. I'd like, I, I, is okay. So now we can see the whole list. Is that right? Before we go on? Yeah. Or on the job list, if, if I think we should wait, they said they're going to bring stuff to next month's meeting. So yes. I think it might be wise just to wait to see what they have. But I will say that from working with these groups and other groups, uh, including Lesson, if folks know anybody who, needs jobs, they are struggling to find people, not just for ESCR, but for a range of other projects. They can't get people in the door. 
apparently everyone's rich, doesn't need money, but it's, it's, it's been a struggle for a lot of companies on the Lower East Side, as small and large, to find people. So if you know people, please send them an escort or a lesson because they, they really need people. All right. Um, and then the next item, which does speak more to what um, Charles had mentioned, um, just amenities um, in parts of the area that are open and then also um, areas outside of Esker, um, alternates, alternate, excuse me, alternate green space, alternate amenities. I know that this was something that parks we've, it seems like they've, they haven't quite presented that information. I know as it relates to like barbecue pits and things of that sort, but we know clearly like making sure that there are um, the park areas of the park remain open that are also that that they're also adequate is important um, how we want to move forward with that what kind of information you all would want in order to um, assist in that and communicate with that Diane yeah so I, th I think there are a couple things. Whoops, can you hear me? Yes. All right, said I was still muted. Uh, I think there are a couple things there. Um, I think, you know, the maintenance of East River Park has, you know, long been a struggle. It's a big park. Sometimes it's a little bit understaffed. Um, you know, I'm sure there are extra challenges in keeping it clean right now. We're still at the tail end of the pandemic. It's harder to drive the vehicles around, things like that. Um, and it would be good to have someone that we could talk to about that. Um, in a collaborative way and be able to say, hey, we noticed that it's getting real garbagey over here or something, you know, and be able to just have a, a, like a, you know, sort of really constructive exchange about things that we see as park users um, that could improve the condition of the open sections. Uh, I think on the, on the other note, on um, amenities outside of the park, the two uh, that I am aware of um, that are still open questions are the condition of the bicycle lanes and whether or not the detours that we're sending cyclists on are safe and usable. And then the lack of a replacement for the greenway. Um, if you went to CB3, I think you heard Desiree say that, you know, uh, they had noticed that people were, you know, running and walking, you know, on in areas that you know might be under construction for other reasons or as part of Esker and that they thought it was dangerous and all that and I think you know that is a direct result of the fact that um, the needs of pedestrians other than just you know um, you know being able to walk around the small areas of the park um, have not really been taken into account um, in the Esker mitigations. Um, I know that this the the Greenway replacement came up the last time we met. Um, and I think some people were wondering if the CAG has an appetite to take that on or, or not. So um, that, I, I think that's a great question. Is this something that we want to, to get into and advocate for? Anyone I am you? sorry, for my behalf, at least, can you clarify a little bit what you mean about greenway replacement? So, you know, East River Park and the Pier 42 area down to Montgomery Street were pretty much a continuous, uh, you know, path. But the, the shared use path is the greenway, right? And so, uh, you know, people riding bicycles for leisure, people commuting, um, there are usually a lot of like Grubhub and seamless delivery people using that space, you know, a lot of people using that as a, a corridor for recreation or commuting. Also tons and tons of runners, you know, on the weekends, um, DDC studies that they did for the environmental impact statement for this project noted that thousands of people were coming into the park every weekend uh, on foot, you know, walking and running and, you know, not just walking into the park to use an amenity, but going for a long walk along the waterfront. And um, one of the pieces of feedback that we've been hearing pretty consistently at ERA is that people feel like there are no safe alternatives, safe meaning car free um, <clears throat> or well protected from cars. And so people are but, you know, they're still going to ride their bikes. They're still going to go for walks. They're still going to walk their dogs. They're still going to run. Um, and they're doing it in ways that 
they can figure out and they may not be the safest alternatives because there is no, there is no alternative offered as an escrow mitigation, um, except for the bike lanes. But you know, there are problems with some of the areas of the bike lanes that have been officially you know, made the detour for the duration of the escrow project. Okay, thank you. Can I just add to that? Um, I mean, we just had a similar discussion with, with uh, Desiree that it's a big concern for CB6 because you know we have very little open space and that continuation of the Greenway was extremely popular and it's really something that has never been replaced or they haven't given us any alternate alternatives. So it's, it's a big concern for the people to the north as well. Thank you. Um, Wendy? Uh, so I wanna second what Diane is saying about the bike lanes, running lanes, space for people who wanna move. We're losing it and um, it's very important to health. Um, I wanna add that um, I did do a walk down the west side of the drive. So from Houston down to Corlears and I sent a report to um, Lake, who's the, um, oh, Nega, Neg, Neg Wait, uh, Lake W, I don't, Lacqua. Um, but, and I suggested for when the Delancey Bridge is done, because I don't know that you could do it, but that could really open up in a nice way if it were, it makes some space for some of that. And I want to say there'd be sloppy in the park on the weekends. So two weeks ago, they locked off the field, the big field where everybody takes their dogs right at Houston Street, couldn't get in it at all. Last weekend, the, the walkway collapsed along Corlears. I don't know if you saw the pictures, but it folded in on itself and you would have to get down below four feet to, if you really wanted to make the ferry, you'd have to like really duck five feet. So you know, that the park is not being watched on the weekends. Some of the work, some of the gates could be opened up that um, there's no workers there, that everything's sealed, it's safe. I assume if it is, why not open it back up? Uh, especially there's gonna be like, like we all know, lots of people in the park very soon. So um, I'll leave it at that, but I would like Charles to talk a little bit about the gardens because we have 54 community gardens and very important part of this, what's outside of the park question. Well, I mean, the gardens are trying to be open as, they, um, as the city allows them to be, but they're not gonna be open until April officially. April till October is the official uh, dates for the parks, the gardens to be open. Um, and they are open to the public, but whether or not but the parks department is gonna add any extra um, measures to to uh, to the gardens, I, I, I'm not aware of anything like that. So right now the gardeners are on their own. I mean, there are some problems. Um, there was problems last year, the year before when people were allowed to drink on the street, people in the gardens were very afraid of that because they didn't know what kind of situation they could walk, walk into or run into. Um, and so there's a lot of fear out there on the streets anyway, and the gardens are part of this, because the gardens are open to people, some gardens are, gardeners are afraid. That's my, that's the feeling I'm getting, but hopefully that'll pass as, uh, as, as COVID declines and um, people will be more open to other people. Right now though, I don't, I don't have anything from Green Thumb as far as, uh, additional programming in the gardens. I mean, Longs is gonna do some additional programming, but that's up to us, so. So, um, um, can I just ask a question to Charles directly about this? Because I came to a meeting several, maybe four years ago with Alda Chan, three years ago, who's head of resiliency for parks. And we asked for benches outside of gardens and support and, it's similar to like what Diane is doing with here's, you know, the, there's this uh, through the Hort, there's a whole team of people that now help with the open street on Avenue B and that's paid work. And it's been very good for 
the street, I think something like that would be great for the gardens. And maybe that's something we can advocate for is that the Hort team that's already there extend to the gardens, bring on more people. They've already got it going. I don't know what Charles thinks of that or what gardeners would think, but. Well, I'm not sure what they would think either. Uh, the gardeners are not getting paid. And so there would be some kind of conflict I would think with other people getting paid. Um, but I, I'm sure that people would be open to the discussion. Um, there's been no um, official contact that I've heard of with uh, opening the gardens with with paid volunteers. I've or not paid paid people rather than volunteers, garden volunteers. So I'm not aware of anything that this the Parks Department is contemplating right now. Hmm. Okay, I don't know either. I just had that memory from the past that that was a possibility, and it would be like somebody on rounds who would come by, clean up if there is a mess and just help manage the garden, but not really be sitting there like, or working in the garden like a gardener would. It would be like, a, you know, support staff. But yeah, we anyhow, met with, two years ago, we met with, we met with the, um, oh, one of the uh, parks uh, assistant commissioners talking about possibility of opening up the gardens more and having some uh, paid staff or something to help manage the gardens past their opening hours and things like that and clean up, but uh, it never went anywhere. So um, I don't know what mitigation money is available to anything right now. Um, okay. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll be quick. I, I had you know, Diana to answer my question about the, the uh, Greenway, but just one further clarification on that. Uh, and then did you have a suggestion? I know you mentioned the pedestrian experience is not what it used to be. Um, and I understand the bike lane issue because I've raised that many times, but it's often helpful to present to the city or parks or whoever an alternative <laughs> as opposed to giving that responsibility to, to them. And I was wondering if you had thought of anything other than what the mitigations were, and that was the open streets, a ton of them, which presents its own set of problems. But did you have anything in mind? Uh, yeah, open streets is definitely not a, a mitigation for the closure of the Greenway. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think what most people are tending to do at the moment is run down the west side of the FDR. Obviously, you know, they're running into construction at the Williamsburg Bridge, at Delancey Street, soon to be Corlers Hook, and then, you know, having to cross Montgomery to get over to the waterfront. Um, but I think that being able to collaborate with the city on how to manage that space safely seems like the sort of the most organic alternative because that's what people are starting to do. And uh, I expect to see more people taking that route once the weather warms up. Okay, understood. Yeah, I just wanna add, this is Frank again, uh, uh, Trevor, just so you know, from your uh, CB3 Parks perspective, I mean, I. I I know Desiree was talking, uh, I can't remember right if it was at a parks meeting, you know, we want people to, you know, not go, for example, underneath the Delancey Street Bridge. Uh, and I, I do. Uh, and my real point here is I see a lot of seniors do it. And it, it isn't really safe. Um, but, uh, you know, runners are a whole different story too. But uh, in particular, when I see, you know, seniors and, and people with walkers, and they're still taking something that's more dangerous, I think that that needs to be re-examined in some way. Um, I, I don't, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really have a great suggestion, uh, but I just think that, you know, if it's possible to make some, you know, amelioration to that, or um, because it, it is kind of directly from A to B from people who are uh, below Delancey, who are maybe are going up to Baruch or any of those, uh, you know, NYCHA areas or anything like that. So um, I'm worried that there's going to be some kind of issue, some kind of accident in the future. Okay. And, yeah, and I think that's what thing. I, I'm sorry. Go I was just going to say to Frank, that's, that's, you're expressing what I was trying to say, which is since people are going to do it anyway, let's collaborate on how to do it safely. Makes sense. Just one last thing, and we had raised this at someone had raised this at the last meeting about summer stage and the funding and the fact that they were in East River Park. And to make sure that any of those summer stage uh, events happen at nearby parks, um, at all parks, because it's it was programming and programming obviously is important. And I don't I don't want us to lose some programming 
because uh, those ex those events are quite expensive. But I'd like to see them spread out among parks in our district. So if we can push that, because summer stage is going to happen in a couple of months. So sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah. So anything else around um, amenities outside of parks? I'm, I'm, mind you, I I'll just want you to let you all know I am taking note. We are taking notes on this, and that we'll re we'll, we'll circulate them out. But anything um, as it relates to, um, yeah, amenities, open space outside of the park. I just raised my hand for the next for the yeah. next bullet. Not. Um, not Oh, okay. so we can move on to the next bullet um, to phasing. So, Stephen, if you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, I just want to to uh, make sure that the the this the I think it's phase three of PA two, which is like the the next phase of Sty Cove. Uh, just want to get some clarity on on um, on that, and then also just there's a there was an open question about our there's supposed to be a berm that's built. Um, but it, there's a kind of an open question. We brought this up with our EDC meeting around, um, uh, the, the berm and phasing with that and our building, which is not part of ESCR, but is funded by EDC and OMB has issued a, you know, like a, a certificate to proceed. So it's, it's moving. Um, but. Uh, so fully funded, but just we're just the uh, just want to make sure that there's some clarity around the berm aspect of it. So two different questions, and then and then lastly, if if you guys could bring back up that that um, the 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 map of of where the swing gate is, I found our site. Uh that is a um, presentation that um, Desiree took with her, but she will, oh, we'll, we'll, okay. we'll get a copy and we also put it up on the website, but we can just Perfect. email her and ask her to email that and we'll, we'll, we'll no distribute problem. that to you. Okay, okay. So anyway, the, 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 the berm and, um, and then just the, the timing of the phase of, uh, phasing of, of phase three of PA2, which I think right. is the rest of our, I think that's it. I think that's the right thing. <laughs> All right. Um, what, uh, Diane, then Wendy. Now, on this one, I was just going to comment that in general, um, the CAG hasn't asked about schedules um, in a consistent way for a long time. Um, I know that, you know, there are specific questions that Stephen just mentioned about, you know, how things are going to unfold in the in PA two, and then in PA one, you know, I know we have questions about when the flood wall work is going to start. You know, how long is the utility work going to take? When's the flood wall work going to start? Will they be doing flood wall work along Pier forty two this summer while the the temporary deck is open? Things like that. And I I was actually planning to ask the CAG whether. You know, we want to go back to making that a regular part of the questions that we ask DDC. All right, we that we haven't quite asked for that in a while. Um, and honestly, I don't think we were very successful in even getting um, anything regular or clear. So we can go back on requesting that. Um, maybe like a more general, and then I'll allow us to, that we can get to them, we can get from um, DDC before the next meeting so they can come, we can provide the questions and they can come with answers. Um, and just did, right minutes before this meeting started, DDC, Desiree sent me over um, the outstanding responses to some of your facing questions. I'll share those tomorrow, but just heads up. Um, Martin, then Wendy. Uh, earlier on in discussion with the designers, we had asked for uh, emergency, at least one emergency call box uh, in the PA2 area, considering that these uh, concrete walls are blocking the view of the park 
from Avenue C, for instance, or anyone driving by, uh, it, it, it would be potentially dangerous if there's not a, uh, an available call box. And they never really gave a straight answer about that. And, and uh, well, uh, to answer the, the prior question, the berm will be the soil that's piled up against the wall, against the wall between the East River and, and the wall. Wendy? Um, thank you. Um, so for air quality wise, yeah. I see that's on the list. Yeah. Order, have we, we've already, so that's gonna go out at the end of the week. And um, is there anything, you know, like Robin mentioned, she's, the wind is stronger. Several people have noticed the air feels different a block or two in. And we do have, the three monitors that have been up now since June and continuous data from then. But we started wondering, is there other kinds of data that should be followed like health data about this neighborhood? Um, I don't know if there's existing, and I do know there's existing numbers around asthma or COVID, but it might be interesting to, you know, to talk with some experts and I'm not one about what kind of data actually shared uh, a rounded picture, because to me, it's important, it's important that um, people have a right to know what's happening around them because of it, if it is a problem, and if it's not, fantastic. But I'm, I'm very concerned, actually, and I'd really love to let air quality and uh, filters be part of the, the CAG's overview. Water, soil, there's so much going on here. Frank? Yeah, thanks, I'll be quick too. Um, I wanted to just kind of tie in what uh, Diane said uh, about like a schedule and being on track of that, but I know that you heard that. Um, but the reason why I wanted to just reiterate that is because um, I've been feeling like uh, personally on this CAG, we have so much involvement in, uh, I mean, let's be honest, there are people who are not for this project uh, and they're going to look for any cudgel to kind of, uh, you know, take it apart and raise and stoke fears that, you know, may or may not be uh, legitimate. But I'm thinking back when Chris Collins, and I think it may have been one of his last meetings, uh, he mentioned how the, uh, you know, not just pick your battles, but he also mentioned something I thought was very important, which was a distinction about the there's there seemed to be at least my impression was a distance between the construction companies and how they're operating versus how um, DDC is trying to try to get information from them. And I'm concerned because so much of our activity is involved in the now that we're not looking um, forward and we're not planning in, in a forward thinking kind of way. Because again, a lot of the air is sucked up by like trying to disqualify the merits of the project rather than um, for those of us, uh, and I think there's, you know, everyone here uses the park to some degree, whether it's north or south. I remember when the park reopened in its last kind of reincarnation, uh, the pavers, they were moving, they were really pretty bad. Uh, and it didn't seem really um, like long term uh, that that was going to be something that. Uh, would survive. And I'm just concerned that like, we're not thinking ahead enough. And I think the schedule is a good kind of um, framework for us, you know, so maybe people want to focus on certain ideas. But, you know, if we could sort of integrate that, if people are more open, uh, in terms of like, yes, there are issues we have to deal with now, but we could also be more proactive. And the last thing I'll say uh, is a question for Paula and Tara. Do you, uh, have we passed the bylaws yet? Are, are, are we set on that? Because that's been bouncing around for a really long time. And I think that that also is gonna help give us some structure and, and really kind of help guide us too. So if yeah. we are not, I hope that people will respond and so we can just you know move on from that. Yeah, that was yeah. gonna be one of my clothes and cleanup items. We're still, I mean, I'm still gonna take 
or I'll let Charles and, and Trevor speak, but just we do need to wrap up. Um, we are still, we still have one more outstanding to get quorum on the vote to vote. So um, please, if you haven't already, but Paula will be chasing you down um, if you haven't yet already voted. But um, again, we are at time. So um, Charles, then Trevor, and then we, we really need to unfortunately um, stop the meeting. We do wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is, is it possible that we could set up some kind of liaison within the Parks Department and the CAG because there's going to be ongoing issues for the parks and for mitigation outside of uh, East River Park that we could maybe address directly to the Parks Department um, that does nothing to do with DDC or anything else that would could be very, very helpful for the neighborhood. Um, I'm not sure that we have an actual liaison with the Parks Department, but it might be a good thing to reach out to them and see what we could come up with. Um, my other one question that was just raised about the berm, if it's put on the west side of the, of the wall, how does then the swing gate work? If that's, I'm not sure that how that works, but thank you. Yeah, well, we're gonna get an answer from that for that. Um, and uh, then Trevor, and then we will we'll have to continue this conversation. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, with regards, it, this is just comes from experience with dealing with the East River and Esplanade portion that opened up between Montgomery and Brooklyn Bridge. It was a 10, it was delayed, but in the end, a lot of the institutional knowledge was gone and a lot of the amenities were installed. Uh, there is a mass mailer. It's very technical. It's, it's hundreds of pages, but it's it's a great resource to look at if you're that sort of nerd to, to make sure that they are putting in what was promised. Um, and I think I don't want to make in, in, in response to what Frank was saying. I think it's important that we look forward, but we look at what we're supposed to get. And if you could ask them for that mass mailer, um, I, I don't know if it's still available from, it was on a, a file, a drive or something, that'd be helpful for those, for those folks who want to do it. I know there's the East River Alliance who's, who's working to, to sort of stewardship, steward the park. And I think a group like that would be helpful. Okay, we'll see what we can do about getting that mailer. Um, we almost got through everything, but we will continue this conversation. We'll update this document. We'll circulate it around. But I mean, we do know at least like for the most part, I think the most pressing items, at least for now, obviously being the track house um, and the, the comfort station, um, as well as a desire for just um, but more like a, a, a true phasing schedule um, moving forward for you all to react upon. Not to say that these other items are not priorities, but um, it just seems like these are the ones that are surf surfacing more immediately. Um, so we will we'll have subsequent communications around these items um, in the next few days. And again, um, I believe Paula will send out, um, I think there was some email that was sent to us right before this meeting um, that she will send out. If you have not put in your vote on the vote for the bylaws, please, um, do so. Um, I, I think you know we would. Be, I know it's. I know it's onerous, and we do send out. We try to minimize the amount of emails that we send you all. But given that there's so much, a lot of the work does have to happen over email um, as it relates to votes. So um, we would like to try to get these communications out faster. Um, so please um, keep an eye out for any subsequent emails coming up. We will be in touch. Um, we will let you all go because yeah, we we really want to be more respectful of your time moving forward. So thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. And I did want to say there are still driving on the um, leaving of, of kicking up a lot of dust, folks. So if you see it, take a picture. Parks can be out there, but the other trucks. Let's see if we can get them to stay on the the um, op on the construction side of the of things. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>